My guest this week is Logan Lin. Logan is a songwriter, producer, filmmaker, television personality, and activist who Billboard writes has made a career out of crafting catchy, disorderly songs that almost all include big beats, fun melodies, and cheeky lyrics. He's been producing and releasing music for the past 25 years and has albums and singles on Caroline Records, EMI Records, the Dandy Warhols Beat the World's Records, and Kill Rock Stars. In 2018, Alternative Rockers Portugal the Man partnered with Logan Lynn on infusing advocacy into their summer tour, engaging the crowds around music and mental health at each sold-out show. The following year, it was announced that Lynn had officially joined the Portugal the Man team in the role of the PTM Founder Executive Director to help build the band's charitable foundation, which he launched in partnership with the band in 2019. Lynn also joined forces with tech company Top Level Design in 2019 to bring the Dot .gay platform to market alongside George Takai, GLAD, Centerlink, PFLAG National, Adam Lambert, Roxanne Gay, and other queer luminaries. And Logan was also named one of the Out 100 in the Performers of the Year category by Out Magazine. And it gives me great pleasure to welcome to Revolutions Per Movie, Logan Lynn. Hi, Logan. Hi. Hi there. Thanks for having me on. I'm really excited because you're the first guest that has ever had a parental advisory sticker on their record that I've talked to. <laughs> and I think that's Great. super cool. Do you remember? I love being here. Was that a label choice at the time? Or is that just like that? That was such a thing from the past. Yeah, I mean, that that thing ruined my childhood years, basically <laughs> made it where I or it like made music mystical, one of the two. But yeah, I, I have always said what I wanted to say, how I wanted to say it. And I have earned several of those badges. I think in the early days, it was label. And then now it's like Apple or some tech person. Right, right. But it's so funny because, you know, like your last record, New Money, you know, yeah. it's just like, yeah, the lead songs eat and drink and smoke and shop and fuck. There you go. That's your hit. <laughs> You know? Yeah, love it. Yep. I had a question about how you, you know, you've been making music for so long. And yeah. I feel like Adu had kind of an indie rock, you know, sheen on it, traditional instrumentation, bass, guitar, drums. My movie star was vocal piano. And then the last record was very pop, you know, got to my heart because I'm a synth pop yeah. kid too, you know? <laughs> Good, and that. so. Does your lyrical content drive the instrumentation of your record or how do you decide where you're going to go with this? Yeah, I you mentioned that I've been doing it a long time. I I get so bored with doing the same thing over and over. I think traditionally everybody sort of expected me to be doing like a kooky, quirky electronic pop thing. And so I I wanted to make a, glo a glitzy, glossy rock record right and then i was like what if i quieted it down what if i just like shut up and made a piano record yeah. i think a lot of that that you're mentioning is me experimenting and feeling bored and free to do whatever the hell i want sure. um and then you know back to my roots with new money I, I think getting signed to kill rock stars and it being the middle of the pandemic and we couldn't go dancing like i just wanted a gay club experience to happen and, and tried to make that happen at home with with that record and the label was down this this album that's coming out um starting this month starting in february 2024 uh and then coming out all the way in june uh is called softcore and it is i think kind of a combination of the of Aju and um new money that's not cool. not not so much in theme but in sound like there's a little bit of uh rock there's a little bit of dance i feel like it's a little bit time machine back to the music i loved in my youth um so to answer your question in a very long drawn drawn out <laughs> way um yes yes it starts lyrically and then and then i think i listen to how the songs feel like they're supposed to be and then that, that that determines the producer, that determines who I work with. You know, I was raised in an acapella church. Yes. And so all of my songwriting always kind of starts in this weird acapella spiritual way. And wow. then music is secondary to that. Yeah, your upbringing is pretty amazing. It was Nebraska? Is that right? Yeah. Boo. Oh, I mean, no, I've healed. It's fine. Uh, yeah, just the smallest, worst possible place for a out gay child to 
burst into the world. Sure. I, um, I, I think it, it gave me a lot of good stuff, you know, around values around like, um, I really, really enjoy, uh, quiet earth land, uh -huh. <laughs> things like that. Like I, I'm into that part of it, but the culture piece is so weird and twisted and bad. Yeah. So I was, I was definitely part of that and affected by all that. Well, the film you picked, 2018's Vox Lux, uh, you know, it. I'm so curious to get into this with you because I had not seen this film. Um, oh. I, I, this film, I think, came out right when I was closing down the... No, I, the video store was closed by this point, I believe, when this came out. Yeah. It had been on my radar a bit, and I really liked Brady Corbett. I liked his acting. You know, he was in yeah. 13... And mysterious skin, funny games, real easy, light fare. <laughs> you know, <Yeah>. so <laughs> you know, he'd made films before. So I'd heard about this, but it it really I it was I'm so curious about what made you pick this film. I mean, there's so much to talk sure. about, but like just when when did you see this film? Did you see it in the theater? Did you hear about it? How did you discover this? I did. Yeah. I saw it in the theater. I, it was like a random thing. Like I was just like, Oh, that looks super weird. Like, what is that? I'm going to go see it. Like I had just seen black Swan mm -hmm. and it was in like a Natalie Portman moment of some sort where sure. I was like, everything she does is cool. I swear to God, I'm just going to watch it all. <laughs> so that was part of that. And it was so astoundingly strange yeah. the, from the moment it started, just like the way the credits even are at the beginning, just everything about it felt off. Yes, And it creeped me out. It creeped me out so entirely that I was like, oh, my God, I got to watch that again and again and again. And I have, you know, I've, I've there's something about it that I am moved by, I think. Mm -hmm. I think specifically probably having like a really traumatic experience that leads you into music. I think yes. I can relate to that personally, having music be like the pathway to healing or to like finding community of people that have some sort of shared experience. It's a very heavy lifting film and there's has dark moments that are funny, but yeah. what was really interesting about the film was I wasn't sure that I liked it, but I can totally replay it in my head. It stuck <laughs> with me. And the more yeah. I read about it and the more I thought about it, I really think it's a, kind of an amazing film. The film starts with narration and Willem Dafoe does the narrator in it. And I guess he was just asked like a week before to just come in and read this stuff. No and he was like, <laughs> it was a really quick thing. I didn't know what I was yeah. doing. It, it starts out, it says, Celeste is born in 1986 on the losing side of Reaganomics. Many years before Celeste rolled off the cultural tongues, she might not have been described as all that special or conspicuously talented. However, she did possess that proverbial something, which on occasion captured the attention of all the other teachers and young peers. A very savvy businesswoman in the beginning, she was kind and full of grace, and at least she wrote her own lyrics. No one could take that away from her. She would be 13 going on 14 years old in the year 2000. And that is kind of the start. And then it goes backwards to the prelude of 1999. The film is kind of broken up in a couple sections. So you're you're kind of like, oh, this is going to be a traditional tropey music film. Yeah. The reason she's a success or on anyone's radar is she's in a school shooting. Yeah. That's really shocking and very upsetting at the beginning of the film. It's just right out of the gate. And she's one of the few survivors. And that credit sequence you talk about, I loved it. It was one of the best credit sequences I've seen in years. It really reminded yeah. me of 70s filmmaking where... The film is just the tragedy is moving along and they're telling everyone who's involved in it, the lighting people, the sound people. And it really knocks off your expectations. Yeah, it's it's super kooky. And you're right that it's a visceral experience that they throw at you at the beginning. I think like they bring you into the trauma of the shooting and then send you into the ambulance. Right. Yes. And in the, the middle of the ambulance ride, you're watching like. As you say, like the cinematography credits, I wish it's just a tr it is a trip and a half. Yeah, and I I think there's something about the way that they do that 
where I just was interested on a movie making level, right? Like forget what's happening. Like I was just like, oh, this is so weird. I've never seen this before. And so it drew, it drew me in in that way. Yes. And it continued to do that, I think, throughout the, the movie. Like it does a bunch of weird stuff where I'm, I still can't believe they did that. The music scene at the end is so long. Yes. It is like you go, they, they do the whole concert, not like clips of songs, entire songs and performances. No, I can't wait to talk to you about that because that also was really ambitious and interesting. And I, again, I was like, I'm not sure this is working. All these parts, you know, it, it's, it, there's yeah. two different actors playing. Um, Celeste, there's an actress playing her when she was young, and that's Rafi Cassidy. And then Natalie Portman plays her later in the film as a young adult. And then the woman who played the young Celeste also plays the older Celeste, Natalie Portman's daughter, Albertine, in it. Same actress. Yeah. That I thought was really handled really well. And I thought Rafi Cassidy, who is in it more than Natalie Portman was kind of amazing. That seemed like a Super really amazing. hard part to play. Cause what happens is she kind of, she writes a song while she's with her sister, while she's recuperating in the hospital from her trauma. She's one of the few survivors. And so then she performs this song at a, um, at a vigil and people are filming it. The song gets taken over by America. It becomes their song. Yeah. It's their thoughts and prayers thing. And people are starting to make it into the thing. And she becomes a celebrity through this tragedy. And so you were talking about how you came to music and, you know, lyrically and stuff through, you know, the things that you yeah. talk about through your personal trauma and stuff like that. Did that, yeah. when you're watching this, did you go like, oh shit, I see some of this, even though it's not the same story. Yeah, it's like super magnified in a way, right? Like it's my my trauma was like long and lower level at times and just over years and years. And that is different than having some kind of like really traumatic experience all at once. Um, but it, I think the reaction is the same, right? Like we are um, feeling people who think and we have this way of, like dealing with whatever's happening to us, it, it sort of doesn't matter if it's like all at once or over time, like trauma is trauma and, you're, and the trauma response is, is similar. So I did, I do feel, uh, I, I think there's a similar through line there just around like, I would have never gotten into music if I hadn't needed to, if I hadn't been somehow expressing something that I couldn't speak otherwise, like it was an outlet for me to, get the poison out in a way that I really needed to. I had like a toxic thing going on that I needed to alleviate. And so I think trauma is that way for everybody. And they, I felt like they did a good job of showing just like the one plus one is two of it all. Yes. Where, you know, bad thing happens. You make something beautiful out of the bad thing. You get rewarded somehow. And yet you're still in the bad thing. Right. You know, just because you've written a song about your trauma or you've gotten an award for a record about this bad thing that's happened to you doesn't mean that you're healed. And so I, I think they did a good job of like highlighting the complexity of spotlight in the midst of fame or in the midst of trauma, fame by way of, you know, hardship, just all of that stuff, which I do think is, you know, kind of cliche in the industry. But also the reason it's a cliche is that it happens all the time and it's like a very real the very real thing. So yeah, it's like recording sessions, label problems, artwork yeah. problems, management <laughs> yeah. problems, tour logistics. It's like yeah. the film does not yeah. really gravitate onto any of the joy of being a musician or or a performing artist. It's no. it's about just being thrown into this thing and and having to kind of accept the role that that you all of a sudden the public's thrown on you because we're talking about it's an interesting choice that she chooses not to all of a sudden start a band like oh, i'm gonna start a sonic youth band or you know something right. like an indie <laughs> indie alt thing or a riot girl thing yeah. it's pop she is like 
Madonna, Pink, you know, Taylor Swift, that is her world. And that, that I thought was a really interesting choice. And I, I, it made me wonder, do you think like pop artists, sometimes I do feel like they bear their souls in a way more than indie rock people do sometimes. Like, yeah. I don't know. I just had your, I wanted to get your thoughts on that because I feel like you play in that medium a bit. I do. I mean, I'm a weird one because I've got one foot in indie and one foot in like this kind of, you know, the outskirts of mainstream pop land. Um, I think there's something that happens to female songwriters and queer songwriters and, and probably pop singers where they're expected to do a little bit more because they're not writing or playing music or something like they're expected to bear more physically. Like we're showing more skin. There's something about like, you have to be overtly sexual for that to work in that, in that um, world, which is why like my songwriting kind of works in that world. Cause I've always just written about sex in a way that is kind of unflinching, but I, I think there is, especially in that, that movie, there's like a, a thing where she's expected to dance in the midst of her recovering. Yes. She, she's like, I, I can't dance too hard because I've got this bullet lodged in my vertebrae. Right. And the chick's like, well, can you do this slide? And she's like, yeah, I got it. And to me, like, that is so exactly how my major label experience was. Like, people were like, oh, good, good song about cocaine and struggle. Um, no one, uh, no one's going to ask you how you're doing or if you need help, but like, keep on singing about the cocaine and now dance. Um, and like, we're going to give you all this money to go do a glitzy thing. But like, it was all about me being addicted. Every single song was about, I want to die. And people were just like, cool. This is so great. <laughs> so oh I have a, I have a real experience of that where it was just such a trip in my life to be like, I'm literally telling you all that right. I'm at the end of my road and you're just like, can we get you to say it into the mic? Wow. Um, and that was how that movie felt, you know, like she's, she's just survived this thing. Just barely. She's in a bandage and the team around her, none of them give a shit about her or yeah. if she's okay or healed. They just, they see a pathway to money or to a moment or, or whatever it is. And I think that happens a lot. And it, it maybe is harder to have happen now than it was in 1998 when it was like happening to me. Like, I think the internet is just a lot of people in my history would have gotten canceled if they did, <laughs> if yes. it was happening now. Right. Like a lot of what happened to me just would never happen now. So, um, it's an interesting thing to look back on, but I think it's common. I think it probably looks different now than it did for me or than it does for Celeste in the movie. But I, I think there's a universal thing of like, it's kind of lonely at the top. You, you, you crawl and you scratch to get into the room and then you're in the room and the room is a little dismal. So. Yeah. And the Jude Law character and her manager's kind of interesting because at first he's, he seems protective he's been hired by the parents to take care of them and make sure they don't get into trouble which they do you know she gets pregnant you know first sexual experience and so she has a child really young but it's also he's he doesn't want to get fired from his job and his cash cow yeah <laughs> it's yeah. it's a really weird line he walks and obviously as, as they get older in the film and they have more adult conversations their relationship is much different yeah, but when you were watching it, what was your allegiance? Or... Oh, I he just seems like such an archetype of a dude that's in the industry to me, where he's <laughs> like, "I'm gonna wiggle my way in. Don't worry, parents, I got this." And then it's just like you know, he's making money too. It's it's a it's an interesting thing. I think you know, have I was 17 when I got signed. That first record I put out were wow. songs that were recorded when I was 15 and 16. That shit should not have been released right. is how I feel about it, right? Like I look back and I'm like, oh my God, I just want to apologize to everyone. <laughs> and it's like, but that wasn't really on me. Like I was a teenager, like whoever put that out should apologize. So there's a little bit of that. I think as I watched that movie, just like who's really watching out for you? Sure. I didn't have a sister that was like in it with me. So I think in some ways like that is a, one of the more wholesome parts of the movie is like their relationship yes 
or at least the potential of their relationship and like her enduring love, like all of that feels like kind of beautiful, but I don't think that's very common. I think for the most part, you know, I don't know why we're letting 15 year olds sing. <laughs> I mean, I, I actually do, but like, it is so crazy. And we're like, Oh, did you hear who 15 year old is dating? It's like, right. no, we don't care. Like, Stop watching TMZ. It's super strange that that whole thing, and I think they capture that in a way that is real in that movie. I think so too. Their relationship was really interesting because they were very close, and as the film goes on, they just don't have any respect for each other. They're very different people, yeah. and it's alluded that that the sister is writing, starting to write the lyrics and be involved, and is kind of really the talented person where Celeste is just kind of the face and yeah. the performer. But also, you know, you're talking about this film takes place in 1999. It starts yeah. there. And you're talking about making music in the late 90s. It was also, I grew up and there was so much like transgressive art and music, you yeah. know, and things that were like big black song about fucking, you know, right. it's all, it's just like things were like just, it, you know, it was like kind of, um, you go to the butthole surfer shows and get disturbed. And, you know, it was like you were kind of on the right side of wrong a little sometimes yeah. because <laughs> you, you were, you were fighting against something that, that you, you wanted to upset people, you know, yeah, you were like, fuck all these people who are going to be upset by this because they're on the wrong side of so much. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I'm giving you the revolutions per movie seal of approval. On, Thank you. on being 15 and making music because, you know, I was in Death Midget when I was 15. What do I <laughs> right. know? You know, it was like, and I was it in it for too long. Yeah. Um, you know, writing songs like, you're a nation, I'm a nation. Oh, Thinking that's it. really clever when you're 15. It you withstands know? the test of time also. <laughs> yes. Yeah, no, I, I own it. I've thought about taking all of that down. I'm sure someday I'll get canceled for some piece of it, but I just, I have to own it. That's, it's like that existed. Right. Like if I take it down, then it feels like it, I'm trying to cover something up and like, right. you can't, it's been 25 years. Can't no, cover it's it up. super interesting. And I think it's worth having a conversation about then instead of, I mean, it's. I think it'll be easier to be like, I was fifteen. Where were you? Where, where were you on a label when you were fifteen? Like, you know you have... how forgiving the internet can be. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe this. I'm excited. Maybe this will be my first canceled uh, episode. I love that. And, yeah, let's uh, see what we'll, we'll, we'll we'll really push that. Um, <laughs> so she goes. She's making um, the album, and it's. It, there's a really interesting sidebar that I hadn't heard about because the music in the film scott walker does the soundtrack like the traditional yeah. you know co composition it was his last thing he did before he passed away and sia does the mm -hmm. songs like the actual pop songs but they yeah. talked about this thing at one point when they're overseas in um sweden making this music they talked about the swedish pop mafia and mm. about these schools do you remember this part? I don't. Film? So there, there, there's just like a weird sidebar. And then they start showing like archival footage from the 30s and 40s. And what happened was there were these things called Swedish Municipal Music Schools. And their, their original purpose was an initiative to basically, it was an antidote to Glenn Miller, Benny Goodman, anything, mm -hmm. any bad Western like, you know, influence coming in, like, all right, boogie woogie jazz, it's yeah. sexual. And so they set up these schools to have people learn classical music and traditional music, uh, you know, like from like a national music. And what happened was it eventually failed. But mm -hmm. all these people in it, like, that's where, you know, all the biggies like Backstreet Boys, Taylor Swift, Kelly Clarkson, they all worked with these Swedish producers, oh, you know, One Direction, Katy Perry's uh, California Girls and Britney Spears, if you see Kay, uh, were all by this super producer, Max Martin. And he said, I have public music education to thank for everything. And they basically oh. took this stuff generationally because it was built and yeah. then they misused it. And they basically became, they did 
exactly the opposite that this that Sweden wanted them to do with it, which is protect the youth right. from this thing. And instead, they're making this super sexually yeah. charged pop music for the youth. Right. The film does that. It'll just be like Willem Dafoe talking about this scene. And then you're back to them yeah. <laughs> finishing recording. Yeah, the sidebar feels a little bit like a book in a way at times where you're like, I'm going to go read just like the liner notes quickly yes. to you. So the director, Brady, was working with this person, Chris Braid, who produced a lot of Britney Spears songs. And he said the actors are worried that they won't be able to sing to this track. Should they practice with someone or get a vocal coach? And he said, Brady, don't worry. No one can sing. (laughs) And so they left in that really kind of, you can't tell if the music's good or not. You can't tell if the vocal performance is, is good or not because it's, it's just her voice, very plain, yeah, kind of pitchy, a little unemotional, and they're like, "That's great, yeah." <laughs> you know, we'll yeah. we'll, we'll fix out. it. We'll fix it. Right. Yeah. You know, did you have much trouble with producers and production and and getting your stamp on it, or were you able to push your your you know your thoughts and your ideas on production into your records? No, there's. That whole major label era, like when I listened to From Pillar to Post or some of those things that happened around that time, that it doesn't sound like the record that I was trying to make. Uh-huh. And I think that's because like EMI made us re-record my vocals. They made me go back in. They were like, it, it doesn't register. You need to go back in and record it high and then we'll layer that in. So there's like a whole layer of like me singing Mickey Mouse high vocals wow. that are layered in so right. for whatever fucking reason. And like just stuff like that that I would never do now. It's also like really buried. You know, they were like the first single should be bottom your way to the top because you're gay. And like, you know, nobody wanted to hear that song as the right. first single in 2008 or nine. So I think I there were times where I listened too much to people that were in charge because I was so excited that somebody was paying to make the record or that I had a finally had a real publicist sure okay manager i'll wear a sailor suit if that's what you want me to do like just like bullshit and i would just never do any of that now you know like i'm i'm so far on the other side where i'm like tour the record are you kidding me no like that is like just like now i'm in such creative control and just you know, comfort control over what I will allow the music industry to do to me or make me feel. But like, there were times where I wasn't. And and you can tell, like, those are the times where I like publicly spun out or I quit or I sue somebody or I cry and run off stage. Like, I, there's so many weird videos. And I guarantee you, every single one of those videos of me doing something weird over the years is connected to somebody somewhere forcing me to do something that I didn't want to do. Yeah. Um, and ever since I, that stopped, I haven't done any weird stuff on video. Yeah. You know, like, I'm like, Imagine I just that. need it. I need it people to stop torturing me right. for me to stop acting out. It's, it is a weird scene, the music scene. It is, you know, and I'm always amazed when people can navigate it unscathed, but I think it's hard. I think it's really hard. Super hard. Even the people that are like, it's almost like the more successful you get, the harder it gets in a different way. Sure. And then, you know, trying to pivot from whatever level you're at at any given time. It's just wild. I, I feel really happy with my career in retrospect. Um, and like where I'm at now is great. Love it. But right. holy crap, the living it and the getting from there to here was a super bumpy ride. Thank you, music industry. (laughs) Well, the film does a really good job of that. I mean, like I said, it's very disjointed. And so it's quite untraditional in that way. But it made me think a lot about how pop stars have to be spokespeople, you know, Michael Stipe or Bono or Beyonce. It's like, what are your opinions? What are you thinking? What are you teaching us? What is that? Um, what does this mean? Why are you not? Why is this just why is this just a candy fun song when you should right. be doing, you know, <laughs> you're supposed to be a prophet. Exactly. It's it's <laughs> fascinating. I think that film does a really good job of making you think about those things, because, you know, there's some stuff in it where they're like, I don't want people to think too hard. This is just pop music. 
you know. Right. And then she's making the music video, and I think nine eleven happens right. during the same time. So it's just loaded with global trauma. And what happens is the film splits into act two, which is now Natalie Portman as an, a, a young adult Celeste. She's still very young. Um, and, uh, well, I want to say young adult. She's early 30s, maybe. Okay, yeah, that's what I was thinking. Like 30, 30 to mid 30s. Yeah, and the second act is called Regenesis. And it's a lead up to this big comeback concert she's going to have in her hometown, the hometown of her tragedy. But this starts with this mass shooting attack in Croatia on this beach. And the people who are doing the shooting are wearing the masks that she wore in the music video when she was really young. And so it's like they're using, it's just like the appropriation of her grief into yeah. the art she made and now into another tragedy. I took that as you can't escape your trauma. Like tra I always think about trauma as like a visa card. And like, you can keep putting shit on there, but it's going to keep popping up. They're going to send you a bill. You're going to see it. And eventually you pay that stuff down. Um, and I feel like that happens a lot where it's like, okay, I've, tr I've transformed this into something beautiful, but I haven't healed. Mm -hmm. I haven't actually processed it. So this fucking thing's going to keep peekaboo trauma or like it, it turns into like whack-a-mole and you're like this external things happening or this generational trauma things happening because my personal trauma is like being compartmentalized i i thought that was a complicated thing to try to put into the film but it is yeah. actually like really common real way that trauma happens right like of all the things that happen like she has to like then be associated with it again and I think the way it happened in my life that way was like trauma reenactment. Like I was like in a cycle of because the bad thing felt like home or was like how I had a skill set to live. I kept seeking that out, whether that was a, a type of person or like a drug that gave me a type of experience in my life, whatever that was, like I never processed and healed from my trauma. And so it was fucking trauma whack-a-mole and it was in my songs or it was somebody else and blah, it was just always there and i i think they do that brilliantly in the movie where it's like you know as much as she wants to get away from it she kind of can't yeah and it's really hard in her she is not the same person it's right. and i think that was kind of a really confusing choice at first because you're like this is not the same person because it just jumps a ton of years. Yeah, you're like, why is she talking like that? Yeah, she talks in this like East Coast accent all of a sudden, yeah. and yeah. she's just horrible and mean to everyone and and spoiled. And it's it's and it's funny. Like her performance yeah. in it, she said she was watching like a lot of videos of people spinning out, like you said on yeah. video and things like that. And sure. there's that scene with her and her daughter trying to just have a heart to heart but yeah she's still the daughter's really watching out for her she's really spinning she a fake monster too by that point right like i think they do a really good job of showing like yeah what fame and attention over time does to people in kind of an unavoidable way just i just have seen that in real life so much where you're like you know like if you stop with the big sunglasses everyone will stop looking at us like, right. if you really want to not be looked at, stop acting that way. <laughs> yeah, and they're talking about, you know, she is like a, she's had a $13 million settlement. She had to settle, uh, yeah. you know, the decade-long witch hunt against her. She drank herself blind in one eye from household cleaning stuff. And her sister is basically raising the daughter. You know, they're close. They're, the, the sister, her sister and her daughter are no longer close to Celeste. Yeah. And, and also, she's dealing with all the stuff in the industry. She's like, I'm doing branded content and virtual reality and voices in games, video games. That's where I'm at right now. Even though yeah. I'm a big pop star, I'm also having to hustle and do all this, yeah. which I thought was really a really funny scene, but also really telling him because I think pre-1998, it was so easy to, to be called a sellout right. and to just be like, I remember 
a bunch of Portland bands were asked to do something for Nike, and we were like, no way. Are you kidding? Right. Our careers right. would be t- like yeah. a commercial. Right. <laughs> Yeah, we we have no career left, and now right. it's like congratulations! I saw your stuff in that Adidas commercial. Totally. Yeah, Mud Honey was not doing TikToks. No, no, not at all. It was, it was not the thing. The time they chose is also a real changing yeah. of you know. There's this genre of music. The American underground had risen up yeah. uh, in music, and we thought it was going to change everything. And then it got cannibalized and really generic. And then it just became you know as confusing as ever uh, yeah. and nothing yeah. really changed no some things got worse yes indeed <laughs> yes indeed yes. you know she she basically has to go to this press conference to talk about what's going on with the shooting yeah. and she's so put out and so exhausted and fucked up and you know just a mess that at the press conference she just goes off she's just like you know when i was a little girl i used to believe in god too if they came to their senses they can believe in me instead because i'm the new faith and i'm not afraid of them invite them to the show these cowards in the masks i'll put them on the guest list i've got more number one hits than an ak-475 standard 30 round magazine like that's her press conference and people are just like what but she gets through it doesn't really even move the needle that's also one of the things that happens right like she what i took from that was like she's the way she got to where she is the thing people love about her is that she's over the top she's saying these shocking things it's this like praise 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 for the weird coked out pop star or whatever that yeah. happens we love it and also you know we don't love it after a certain point we also love to hate you for doing it. It's like a both thing. So she yeah. kind of can't win. But I think like just showing up as the thing that you always show up as is a, a very natural inclination. Like yeah. this is what people want. But in a time like that where it's like tragic or like the culture has shifted behind you without you noticing, like it just is really gnarly. <laughs> yeah. There's so many deeply cringe moments in that movie. Like Rai, just as a person who like does press or like you know is just sometimes in some of those rooms yes. i walk it just like uh, i can't believe this is happening like it's like a horror movie to me i think specifically because of the industry that i'm in like it's like a visceral saw level horror movie wow well this is the part of the film that i'm very excited to talk to you about which is the concert <laughs> and it starts with her having a meltdown with her family. You've seen it in a movie before where there's just like, all right, things are just bad. And now they have to get themselves together. And yeah. you're falling down the, the corridors to the stage. And you're like, are they going to be able to pull it together? And there's a bunch of things I wanted to ask you about. One is that backstage ritual. It's like, all right, we're going to go. We're going to say a prayer together and we're going to pop <laughs> each other up. We're going to do it. Woo, woo, woo. And all the dancers and the people. Do you have anything like that before you go on? Hell no. <laughs> yeah, neither do I. <laughs> no, I've also like been on tour with Portugal the Man and backstage with Boy Genius and big bands. Yeah. Nobody does that. I know. It's so weird, isn't it? Nobody does that. I think Madonna did that in the movie for... The movie, I think Janet Jackson, maybe Janet Jackson does it for real. I don't know. Right, like right. there are probably people that have done it, but like, no, that's not a thing. Everybody's just chugging water and taking a couple hits off the vape as far as I can tell. Yeah, exactly. I, I think that's very true. I But I just, I'm, I was fascinated by it because it was, again, something that I've seen so much. And I just was like, I don't think this is that real, I'm, you no. know, but it sure seems to be in movies a lot. Yeah. And so she goes out and she performs, like you said, like full length tracks. The craziest thing you've ever seen in your entire <laughs> Christ forsaken life. They play entire songs that you've never heard before. These are just the songs they've written for the movie. Right. They play in their entirety, along with very close up shots of like the choreo, but like not full screen. I I have decided that what they do is it's also from a sound design standpoint going right. in and out of her in ear monitor. So we're hearing what she's hearing, and then we're hearing the crowd. Like it's oh, interesting. so 
weird. And it, to me, as a person who uses in-ear monitors and has done this like weird, we're going to do this choreo with the lights, like all that, it just felt very inner experience. And then like the, the outer experience hits her and then she's back in the inner experience, which is how I experience performing. So I thought in that way, it's very cool. I still, I've watched this movie a bunch of times and I watched it recently again, just to get ready for this. I, I cannot understand why they did that. Like that, <laughs> the, that part of the movie just doesn't make any sense to me, but is kind of the wildest thing that I like the most in a way. It's like, yeah. so committed to, you are going to listen to these pop songs and watch what it's like to be on stage like you're gonna be in the moment and they i think that was successful like they do suck you into what it's like well there's a bunch of things happening at the same time one is these you've seen shootings several times in this film she's in her hometown playing this thing on the anniversary of this tragedy and there's a part of you that's like okay she's going to get shot. There's this kind of weird dread in this hyper pop world where (laughs) people are screaming and there's, you know, they're throwing all their shapes around on stage. And it was really uncomfortable for me on that. Yes. And so I kept waiting. I was like, all right, here's song number three. And I I actually, you know, I turned the volume down a little at home because I just didn't want the sound of a shotgun, like scaring the hell out of me. Totally. We'll get to in a second. There's other reveals that are very interesting in, in terms of a horror moment, I guess you would say. But uh, the other thing that was happening at the same time was I couldn't tell if it was good or not. I was like, yeah. is this a good pop performance? Are they yeah. are these dan- are these moves good? She still seems <laughs> like she's not the best dancer. Yeah. I was I mean, did you have anything like that? Or I mean, you're, you you know, maybe maybe, you know what they were referencing more than I would. I think it just showed really up close how goofy it is. <laughs> you know, like that's that true. It really is just kind of like a we're lip syncing. We're doing goofy pop things like this. Is, and it is like for me, like the, the reason pop is so handy and the, the, if you look lyrically, oftentimes when I go really deep into pop or dance music, the lyrics are pretty dark. I'm, it's times when I'm really exploring things that I don't feel safe exploring. And so I put this sort of shell of like, that dance around right. it. And I feel like that was kind of what was happening there too, where it's like the trauma or the big message or like all that stuff is happening. But like, they're dancing around like weirdos and it's just it's just like such a spectacle yeah i think that was my my main takeaway there was just the spectacle of it all sort of hiding and making the trauma smaller and smaller and smaller like the bigger the spectacle gets the further in the background the hard part is have you ever in your career felt unsafe on stage uh, I have extreme stage fright okay. <laughs> and have always felt unsafe in general. Mm-hmm. Um, I think not like from a, I think from a gun violence or like a, a scary stalker sort of thing like that always is in my mind since that started happening to people. Yes. I, I think I, I don't do meet and greets. I cancel more shows than I play. I say no more than I say yes. And all of that is because of the world not because something's changed with me um and so i think you know physical safety is one thing this emotional safety piece of like i'm gonna sing about some sort of intimacy or some sort of heartbreak like all that stuff i feel unsafe in general looking at much less talking about or singing about and so i do tend to do um you know i dress it up well you're right. I think she is protecting herself through dance, through costume, through song. I was really fascinated. I read an article about the people who designed their cat suits. Hmm. Um, and they they found out that most of the cat suits that are made for professional shows are actually made of really shitty materials. Right. And yeah. they were trying to figure out the level of garishness to do. Like, you know, do we do Bowie badly? What are we going to do? And in the end, 
the costume designers said they weren't thinking about how Natalie would look or appear in the movie. They were thinking of how the Halloween costume that would be based on this outfit would look, <laughs> which I right. thought was so smart. Like, yeah, that's we're going to do this thing so that <laughs> the teenagers in the audience will be making their own outfits or buying this yeah. thing. It's not the most elaborate visual thing. It's it's like no. a couple colors with a couple things across it. But I thought that was really cool. And, and reading, you know, about Brady making the film, he's like, nobody asked for this film. No. It did not make any money. Nobody liked it, from what I can tell. I yes. mean, I think some people like me really, like, are intrigued by it and own it and and like it and are, like, yeah. weird. But, like, it wasn't a hit. No. And I, I think that the more research I did on it, the more passion I found from people who actually did love it and yeah. were really affected by it. And it made me... You know, I was already thinking about the film a lot because it is really haunting and dark and funny, but very disjointed. Something that I've talked about on, on the show is some of my favorite records growing up were records that I didn't understand on first listen or didn't yeah. love. And then yeah. I was like, well, I bought it. I own it. I like that one song on side <laughs> two. And then you're like, well, side one has some things. And then, you know, a week later, you're like, I'm obsessed yeah. This is means so much to me. And I don't think that film necessarily gets that chance as much. Yeah. But I felt this with it where, you know, when I would talk to people about this because it was on my mind, I'd be like, yeah, this film, I, it'll be interesting to talk about because it's such a strong choice. Yeah. It's not like somebody being like, let's talk about, you know, Woodstock or let's talk about <laughs> Decline of Western yeah. Civilization Part Two. Like, I get why. But sure. I was like, there's something that made Logan pick this. And then you get a twist <laughs> from yes. the narrator, yes. which the, most of the reviews I've seen, the people who love it, this was the part that made them just go like, oh, my God, like yeah. and rewatch it. Yeah. So the narrator says, shortly after the classmate pulled the trigger, she met the devil and made a deal for her life. He would whisper melodies that would bring great change. Close your eyes and repeat after me. One for the money, two for the show. On three, we get ready and four, come with me. Yeah. <laughs> and you're watching her perform as an adult, but you're like, what? Wait, yeah. what? Yeah, full blown Satan. Yeah, a deal with the devil. Yeah, which is very music industry or fame too, right? I mean, I felt like it was a funny choice, but like I've made, I've done that. I got to how I am, not because of like the goodness of my heart, but like we all make choices that are in line with our values and sometimes not. And like that to me felt like a really pronounced, like we're going to do this to get here. This is how you get famous. You have to sell your soul on some level yeah. i actually don't really think that's true but i think a lot of us do that to get what we think we need or where we think we're supposed to go and so the idea that like she actually did that and it worked it's like it just seems like a funny i don't know it made me laugh it, it's, it's like really weird this person when she was a child super christian yeah. and is even telling people not to swear in front of them when right. she's starting yeah. out. So even after this deal she's made with the devil, she's still very puritanical. Right, yeah. I was like, well, I haven't seen that. I haven't heard that in this way <laughs> where I'm completely yeah. didn't see that coming. And it made no, me yeah. think about like the right. title sequence and everything. It just, it it did kind of glue a lot of this stuff together. Some of the herky-jerky and the things that pull you out. It made it yeah. feel more of like, why are you paying attention so much to the traditional story that we're telling here? This is not a film about a pop star. No. This is about so much more. Like you said, it's about trauma, people projecting on you and things outside of your control. Yeah. Um, you know, addiction. So that to me felt like a little bit of a signature from the director to be like, and I'm done. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Case closed. Yeah. I did my job. I love that. I think devil shit is hilarious. 
I always am down. Like one of my favorite movies, the scariest movie in the world is Rosemary's Baby. I love that. It's incredible. And this felt like that to me in a way. Like it's like that level of like, oh my God, the devil again. He did it again. (laughs) Like, I don't know. It's just funny. Well, and it's a cult. This person is trapped in this thing, not of their making, and believing people and trusting people. And they're like, come in here, do this. Now you got to fly over there. No, don't do that. This and that. You know, when they show her as an adult being a terror, it's like, it's because she's finally like, I get to just be whatever I want. I'm tired of saying yes. I'm tired of people controlling me, which is the whole first part of the film. I really was excited that you brought this to my attention. Good. Something I know that I will talk about again and again with people. Yeah. It's a trip and like it's worth a watch, I'd say. I think so too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So at the end of every interview, I ask the same question, but I tailor it um, depending on the uh, the film. Okay. But I think after our conversation, I'm going to change my initial question um, because you think the devil is hilarious. So, I do. On a scale from one to 10, how many deals with the devil do you give this film? <laughs> uh, with one being the lowest. Is that like 10, 10 deals would be perfect film? Yes. I think I give it an eight. Eight deals with the devil? That's exactly what I had here in Blood. Oh, good. So <laughs> the Dark Lord told me that is perfect. the correct answer. So we're on our way. Great. There'll be a knock on the door later tonight, and uh, there'll be some some things you need to sign. I love a traditional deal with the devil. Perfect. <laughs> I really appreciate it, Logan. Thanks so much. Yeah. And congratulations on the new album. Thank you. Talk to you soon. Thanks. Thank you for listening to Revolutions Per Movie. We release new episodes every Thursday, so be sure to search for the show on your favorite podcast app and subscribe to the show. And if you've enjoyed this, it would mean a lot to me if you would rate and review it as well. You can follow us on social media at Revolutions Per Movie and also find out more information about our various guests in the episode show notes. Thanks again, and we'll see you next week. Bye.